Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the Tom's Guitar Show. Uh, I'm uh, Tom. They call me Guitar Tom because I'm often seen with a guitar. They call me on the phone. They say, hey, man, what's your show about? I say, well, it's about, about an hour. But guitars, guitar playing, all things guitaristic. How many times have I said that? I've done like 800 Tom's Guitar Shows. Anyway, so here's the deal. Um, normally, there's a, it's a call-in show. You can call me on the phone and ask me a question about your you know, care and feeding of your guitar or personality problems. Um, it's kind of funny. Uh, Phil and I gave dating advice to somebody once. I think it was Skopinski, were you? Maybe you were on that show too. Somebody asked for dating advice, and I, uh, I, I don't know. <clears throat> well, we, we should treat people decently. Anyway, so wait, 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 I digress. This is this is uh, the the last Tuesday of the month, so this is a Tom's Guitar Show special live from Uptown Bill's Coffee House. If you want to come on down, you could have ice cream. If I've been known to have a bratwurst. Looks like there's some pretty good uh, carrot cake or something back there. Uh, cookies. Bananas. There we go. Uh, bananas are what? Well, uh, yes. He said bananas have less appeal. Um, so, uh, as I say, once a month we do a Tom's Guitar Show live from Uptown Bills. Next month we're going to have a mandolin player come on and we're going to do a combination of uh, choral music, old time fiddle music, and klezmer music. So that'd be kind of fun. Uh, one or two very precocious young uh, kids, children playing classical guitar. But this month it's only me and uh, four readers, so maybe I should play something sort of fooling around like this.
Thank you. I, uh, my, my boom stand here. It's giving me the sinking feeling. Anyway, so, uh, Mr. Skopinski, sir, you, you, uh, uh, you know, I, I, last month I blew you off totally with your reading. So maybe would you like to come and read something for us now? Get a little feedback here. Oh, oh. Well, we had plenty of readers last week, and uh, so, um, you know, there was, always, there was plenty to choose from, and I didn't feel off, and I knew that I would have other opportunities, like tonight. So uh, what I had prepared to read last time, and I brought along again this week, is a poem. Uh, we've started a tradition of doing some poetry readings here. And um, this was a poem that was sent to me via email uh, by a friend of uh, mine back east in New Jersey. It's by the uh, poet, 20th century poet, William Carlos Williams, who's also a Jersey boy. He uh, was born, I believe, in Rutherford, New Jersey, and uh, a doctor, spent his career there. Um, he was an avowed socialist, so, you know, I rarely talk personally about politics here on the show. Um, but, uh, and I'm not going to go into politics too much right now, but my, my friend sent me this in the context of being frustrated, like probably most Americans right now, no matter what your political stripe, with the uh, state of the economy, the sense that the, from the middle class on down, we're s slipping away, and uh, there's a greater gap between the haves and the have-nots, and these multiple corporations who seem to get away with everything, but that's about as far as I'll go politically. Um, but the, the anyway, a, a sense of frustration, like I say, I don't, regardless of your political stripes, I think you could kind of catch the feeling of and, and kind of uh, share in it. Um, the poem is entitled The Yachts, and it's, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to try to analyze it or, or explain it away, I'll let it speak for itself, but basically it's a metaphor. The yachts are the privileged who seem to have everything sailing over the waters of basically the rest of us that can't quite, you know, do anything to the yachts. They mm. kind of have free reign. So um, this is the um, poem, The Yachts, by William Carlos Williams. And I'll do my best to give it justice. I'm not a poetry reader, but I'll do my best. The yachts contend in a sea which the land partly encloses, shielding them from the too heavy blows of an ungoverned ocean, which, when it chooses, tortures the biggest hulls, the best man knows to pit against its beatings and sink them pitilessly. Moth-like in mists, scintillant in the minute brilliance of cloudless days, with broad bellying sails, they glide to the wind, tossing green water from their sharp prows, while over them the crew crawls, ant-like, solicitously grooming them, releasing, making fast as they turn, lean far over, and having caught the wind again, side by side, head for the mark. In a well-guarded arena of open water, surrounded by lesser and greater craft, which, sycophant, lumbering and flittering, follow them, they appear youthful, rare as the light of a happy eye, live with the grace of all that in the mind is feckless, free, and naturally to be desired. Now the sea which holds them is moody, lapping their glossy sides, as if for some slightest flaw but fails completely. Today no race. Then the wind comes again. The yachts move, jockeying for a start. The signal is set and they are off. Now the waves strike at them, but they are too well made. They slip through, though they take in canvas. Arms with hands grasping seek to clutch at the prows. Bodies thrown recklessly in the way are cut aside. It is a sea of faces about them in agony, in despair, until the horror of the race dawns in the mind. The whole sea becomes an entanglement of watery bodies, lost to the world, bearing what they cannot hold. Broken, beaten, desolate, reaching from the dead to be taken up, they cry out, failing, failing, their cries rising in waves still as the skillful yachts pass over. So that's... That's my reading and contribution. That's good. That's good. And uh, I might say that uh, met people who, who feel that, uh, you know, who, who have maybe been conditioned to believe that socialism is uh, the boogeyman and is uh, equivalent with Maoism or something or Stalinism. And uh, so I might mention something about, well, about public roads, public schools, and uh, 
things like, well, that's not socialism. They say, well, what is it? Because if you, you know, if we didn't have common property, public property, you know, like, like roads, you, you know, you have to pay a toll when you go down the road. That, in some countries, they have what they call checkpoints. So, so I don't think I'm particularly a socialist, but anyway. Thank you, thank you. Um, hey, Bob, you want to just lay a couple of those lexic... Bob and I would study... Uh, well, Phil forwarded to me on, by email. The people who are familiar with the show would know Phil. He's been with the show for years. He forwarded some, uh, uh, some, some word things, lexography, basically. And some of these are fun, so if anybody feels the urge to give out with a groan, that is the appropriate response. I wondered why the baseball was getting bigger. And then it hit me. Do you have that in your box? I, there? I, I have a rim shot down here somewhere, but it has, it's quite a ways away up. It's did, simply, uh, did you hear about the guy whose whole left side was cut off? <laughs> He's all right now. Oh, the right. <laughs> there is the groan. The, the roundest night in, Sir, in King Arthur's round table was circumference. <laughs> to, to write with a broken pencil is pointless. When fish are in school, sometimes they take debate. A thief who stole a calendar got 12 months. <laughs> when the smog lifts in Southern California, UCLA. 
The professor discovered that her theory of earthquakes was on shaky ground. <laughs> Should we give him a break from that for a while now? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. <coughs> You'll be back, though, I'm sure. I'm sure we will. But, Tell us a little bit about this guitar. All right, this is, um, this is a Godin ACS guitar, which is Roland Ready. So it has a 13-pin uh, plug here, which has been the bane of my existence because it doesn't always work, and I've had to replace the cable many times. But what it is, is it's a guitar synthesizer. So I can do, you know, all kinds of... I can do all kinds of wild stuff. Okay. It's hardly... I can do whatever I want with it, actually. This was, uh... This is my, my ambition years ago, was to uh, build, like, huge loops of strings and saxophones and bells and stuff, and... Um, but my art didn't go very well, necessarily in bars, but... So, I mean, I can sit here and, and play with this thing for hours, though, like... The Simpsons! There's a oh, Gregorian chant. That's one of my favorites. Like, anyway, oh. Actually, I just turned a photo, uh, total eclipse. I can't remember what it is. Let's see what it is. So what I like to do is, uh, you know, build a kind of a music bed. something like uh Bit of fun, thank you. So, uh, Craig, you have a. <laughs> I was just gonna have a little fun. 
So you, you had one. I, I emailed you about this because I, I remind yeah. you this is a family show. So Right. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. okay. Yes, very much a family show. So uh, this essay is called uh, The Dog's Bucket List, and it grew out of a lunchtime conversation that I had uh, with a couple coworkers. So it's part essay, part list. Um, one day at lunch, I was telling my coworkers, Dan and Amy, that when my family travels, we often don't take our dogs with. I commented, that seems unfair to the dogs. Dan laughed and said, I don't think that matters. He started wondering if dogs had regrets in life, things they wish they would have done. So what would be on a dog's bucket list, to use a popular phrase? That is, things they want to do in life before they kick the bucket. Some of these contributions are in responses to Amy's Facebook post on this topic. They're in no particular order. Bark at the president is on Mount Rushmore. Drive a pickup truck while my human being hangs her head out the window with tongue flapping in the breeze. Catch a fly ball at Yankee Stadium. Complete a task without being distracted by every little squirrel. Make a pilgrimage to the fire hydrant factory. As comedian Stephen Wright said about it when he worked there, you can't park anywhere near the place. Chase and bark at the 800 pace car. Ride the leg of a United States Senator. Disrupt an outdoor wedding reception by running through the buffet line. Be a ball retriever at the US Open tennis tournament. Visit the Field Museum in Chicago and gnaw on a Triceratops femur bone. What are some other things that would be on a dog's bucket list? Run around on the White House lawn and leave a souvenir in the Rose Garden. Finally, successfully catch that tail I keep seeing out of the corner of my eye. Pass the driver's vision test proving I'm not colorblind. Find a rare, valuable Louis XIV chair and chew the stuffing out of it. Once, just once, eat the duck that I swam in cold water to retrieve. Start a restaurant that doesn't let in humans or cats. Chase and bite the postmaster. Oh. <laughs> That's very good. Yeah. That's very good. I, uh, I, had a, I had a good friend who was a dog. Uh, we were together for 14 years. He, uh, when he was a puppy, he used to lie on the stage with me up there in Stone City. But he had bad personal habits, just really revolting to humans. But I suppose he probably didn't like mine either. So. Thank you. 
here somewhere. Anyway, <laughs> thank, thank you. <clears throat> So I'm glad to have all these readers. Uh, whatever this disease has been going through, there's some virus that's been uh, just decimating the population around here. Uh, seem to get me, and most things don't get through me because I, I've been, you know, I've spent a lot of time hanging around with little kids in my teaching thing, and uh, and uh, they're like little breeding grounds of viruses and everything. And but this one got through all my defenses and uh, made me who I am today. Kind of like my head's full of cotton, and I'm not as articulate. And considering how articulate I normally am, uh, that's pretty bad. So, so um, you know, young Tom, you know, I always, like, I save you for last, and sometimes I blow you off, man. Do you want to come up now? I mean, we're only, like, we're, like, just a little bit over halfway through. Or he's going to, uh, he's going to do his, uh, he's uh, doing his thing there. I'm, his official duties, I'm, uh, Yeah, so you, uh, yeah, well. You caught me off guard. Uh, there's a coffee shop here. Yeah. You know, and, and you got to serve people. And You're supposed to be serving coffee, and, and here I am and messing you up. Besides, we're doing a live Twitter show tonight, and I just got finished saying that your music sounded like uh, you were ranging from, or lurching, I said, from Joe Satriani to Hearts of Space. Yeah. And I wondered if you were going to end the show by saying good night, space fans, wherever you are. <laughs> 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 Maybe I should, but it's been done. So my friend uh, Mandy, who was here last week, would have loved that. So she can do that really well. Is she space cadet or? or uh... No, no. She used when she was little. She used to watch the or listen to the show lying on her bed and with the lights out and really kind of scary. Music so, from the hearts of space. Or, yes, or, music yeah. from the hearts of space. Yeah, I always kind of liked that so, that show. I, uh, I, I, I mean, I didn't scare me, but it was always kind of nice, you know. And well, you weren't ever little when it was on. No, I, <laughs> I'm a. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all grown up, and I've been grown up for a long time now. I think, um, uh, I, I don't know how long that show will go on. I'm beginning to wonder if that guy is still really alive or if he's okay. stuffed and it's <laughs> some <laughs> pre-recorded voice doing that. <laughs> Anybody can get right at the mic. <laughs> Hello, this is music from the hearts of space. So what do you think? Uh, Satriani, was that a good, did you like that um, comparison? Yeah, I, wouldn't, I don't mind being compared to Joe Satriani. I, okay. I, it's fine with me. But the hearts of space, you got some questions about. No, that's fine too, but you know, <laughs> it's a, the whole thing is, a, when, okay, when I was young, here I'm, I'm reminiscing, I'm sorry, and, uh, but uh, so I used to live in California, we talked about that before, and, mm -hmm. and one thing that, that happened was that uh, the new age music thing came, oh, sure. came yes, on, you know? Yes. And doing music, though, that had, it was for meditations and stuff, they had the breaths, you know, included mm -hmm. in the music, and I thought it was a very personal thing. Mm -hmm. and, and just like, you know, MTV, when that was, when I, when I was around when that was starting and I was involved with producers and stuff, I, I ran away, you know, from uh, uh, New Age music and, ah. and, from, uh, and from MTV. Okay. And, uh, I've been hiding. You didn't, you didn't buy the entire Wyndham Hill collection? No, I didn't. I, for the first 10 years? Yeah, they were only around for 10 years, weren't they, or something? Well, they were bought up by somebody uh, bigger, I recall. And it but, wasn't the same. You know, they were originally just a post office box at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And I vi that was their office and everything. And I visited there a couple of times just to stand outside. And at Stanford, the post office boxes are not indoors. They're in these wooden uh, frames, and they're outdoors. Hmm. So I just walked up to their box, and said hello, and yeah. nobody said anything back. I, but I hope not. <laughs> they have little people in there, and they... Uh, <laughs> Never mind. I'm digressing. What were Very you going to do for us here? Well, I, you know that, uh, you know that Warren Zevon song, uh, uh, Sleep When of, I'm Dead. Oh no, that one. Okay, yeah. Werewolves of London. And then he re he redid it for San Francisco once. I'm not going to sing it, oh. but he redid it for San Francisco as kind of a spoken word thing. Hmm. And so, you know, what's that holiday coming up? Uh, Halloween. Halloween is yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Boo. Uh, yeah. Boo. Boo. Who? <laughs> <laughs> knock knock. Who's there? <laughs> Boo. Boo -hoo. Please don't cry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I. Sorry. I. We lost focus. I'm sorry. It's my fault. We've. I've rewritten this song as uh, Werewolves of Iowa, but okay. we need a. We need a little rehearsal first. When I see because in the song uh, you're supposed to howl. Every time you hear Werewolves of London, and in this case Werewolves of Iowa. So could we try that? I'll say Werewolves of Iowa, and you. Oh. oh! Okay, very good, very good. This is a nice, nice audience. This will work well. All right, good. I'm going to wait. So, are, are you ready? Man. Okay. 
<laughs> I don't know, that's somewhere from between uh, Bella Lugosi and uh, uh, maybe um, Rocky Horror. Young Frankenstein. Oh, yes, yes, okay, very good, very good. I saw a werewolf with a Chinese menu in his hand walking the streets of Iowa City in the rain looking for a place called Yen Ching or Peking going to get himself a big dish of chicken chow mein Werewolves of Iowa Ow. Ow. Werewolves of Iowa Ow. Ow. If you hear him howling round your kitchen door you better not let him in Little old lady got frightened last night it was that werewolf of Iowa again. Werewolves oh. of Iowa. Oh. Werewolves of Iowa. Oh. He's the hairy-handed gent who took October's rent. Lately, he's been overheard in Mayflower. Better stay away from him. He'll rip your lights out, Jim. I'd sure like to meet his advisor. Werewolves of Iowa. Oh. Werewolves of Iowa. Oh. That's it. That was, that was great. Copies available soon. That was great. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah. So, that was, uh, I imagine this could inspire other people better. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I've always thought about my career. That I, <laughs> and also can serve as an example to others. Yes, yes. An example of what is, well, we're being subjective here. So. so, well, thank you for the opportunity to come up again. And thank you for all of you for uh, being here and for watching uh, the show live from Uptown Bills. Uptown yeah. Can I uh, make a little, do a little plug? Sure. If you're Go watching ahead. the show uh, tonight, we have music tomorrow night at uh, 7:30 uh, in Washington D.C. called Pre. And then on Thursday night, we have live music at 7:30. It's uh, Jennifer, or excuse me, Jessica Smucker, who's from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Hmm. Every day, our postal carrier has come in. He's rewritten. Do you remember the old Smuckers commercial? If it's Smuckers, you know it has to be good. So mm -hmm. he's rewritten that for Jessica. And, you know, if, if her name is Smucker, you know she must be good. Mm. So, and he keeps yeah. asking me, well, have you told her? Right? She's not here yet. It's a couple days away. But anyway, she sounds very good. We played her CD earlier in the uh, coffee shop. What sort of stuff does she do? Is she... Uh, it's a, it's, she's a folk musician, singer-songwriter, mm. uh, good writer. So we're lucky to have, uh, to be in a place where we been attracting people from all over to come and come and play yeah well, I'll tell you it's hard to if you're a musician it's hard to play anywhere anymore it seems like oh really it's, it's hard to get gigs for a lot of people no kidding so I'm told hmm. That. Hmm. okay well we've been blessed uh, I probably well, you talk about a place for them to go oh you provide them it. with a place to be and uh, okay you know. I think I talk to three or four bands a night uh, well they come in overnight usually from our website mm -hmm. or our Facebook page and then then I respond the next the next morning or hmm. so all right bless you yes. <clears throat> and i'll step off now. okay well thank so you so much continue uh, as yeah. young frankenstein or Bella Lugosi I, could, or I could do this, this is called goth uh, this is rock organ it was, um, gothic this is gothic Ooh. Ooh. Because I uh, feel like I got a head full of cotton tonight. I was going to get all rehearsed and everything, but now I think, ah, I'm just going to have fun. So should do the right thing, but.
Yeah, I'm just fooling around. Thank you, thank you. I, I, uh, so, uh, so, Bob, you have some more lexography for us. We were... Uh, there for a second. <laughs> okay, if we're prepared to groan again, we'll see what else we have here. All right. You're stuck with your debt if you can't budget. Ah, oh boy. Sh show <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> Don't you hate a guy that laughs at his own jokes? Yeah, but Actually, these are Phil's jokes. It's Phil's jokes, so it's yeah. all right. So. Show me a piano falling down a mine shaft, and I'll show you an A flat man, min, minor. A flat, a flat minor. minor. Yes. Ah. With her marriage, she got a new name and address. <laughs> if you don't pay your exorcist, you can get repossessed. A will is a dead giveaway. <laughs> a boiled egg is hard to beat. <laughs> When you've seen one shopping center, you've seen them all. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> if you take your laptop for a run, you could jog your memory. A bicycle can't stand alone, it's too tired. In a democracy, it's your vote that counts. In feudalism, it's your count that votes. Ah. <laughs> a guy fell into an upholstery machine. He has fully recovered. <laughs> the, those who get too big for their britches will be exposed in the end. Oh, boy. Our control room told us earlier that the stuff you were doing at the beginning of the show they'd like for their science fiction show. Oh. Well, if they need some science fiction music, I'm, I'm better prepared for that than anything today. Ah. So. But, uh, anyway, I'll move away and let somebody else take a spot here.
Thank you, thank you. So Yale, do you have something for us up here? You, but Yale here's a big, uh, big time uh, PA TV producer now. He's got his show and everything. I'm glad you're feeling better. I, I followed your illness on, I'll just hold this today. I followed your illness on Twitter. I don't know if it was six string Ebola or what. Uh, yeah, I six like, string. I like what you were uh, playing. Actually, not at all uh, inappropriate for what I, I brought to read today. But early, the stuff you're playing earlier, the, the other gentleman uh, made reference to, uh, I believe it was Joe Satriani. Mm -hmm. I really thought, if you're familiar with uh, Mike Oldfield, yeah. uh, Tubular Bells, it had that you know multi-instrumental kind of oh. space thing. Or even perhaps uh, Vangelis, who was the uh, composer to the soundtrack from Blade Runner. So, very interesting stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually like, I, I, I'm interested in soundtracks anyway, and I was just actually, was, uh, actually my wife was trying to get my story straight because she was writing something, and, and uh, years ago I had a, a gig in, uh, in theater doing background music, scoring plays, uh, a play basically with three acts, and I, uh, so I went to New York, we did a stage reading off Broadway, and I met a guy who, uh, who did uh, um, background music for Stephen King television programs. And he did it all with a synthesizer. And I said, oh, I couldn't do that. That's disgusting. We need to have real musicians. But then one thing led to another, and then a few years later, I ended up getting a synthesizer, and then I got another synthesizer. And and uh, interesting to me to be able to make all the kinds of sounds you can imagine. And if you just get both synthesizers playing together, you could just leave the room and let them run the whole show after a while. So. Well, I've got the synthesizer, and i got the looper, so I can record what I just did. So they, they don't need me here anymore. After I set it up, I could just leave, you know. Well, yeah. I was, uh, I don't know if you've mentioned on your show, I will throw in a plug for, you know, PATV, you're well aware. We're having yes. the I Love Iowa City uh, film contest. We're looking for submissions from folks uh, who love this town as much as we do. And I spent uh, a great part of the day today uh, posterizing, canvassing, putting for this uh, downtown. So I thought I'd read something. Uh, an another uh, something I'd written for Little Village Magazine uh, for Valentine's Day a few years ago. So it's kind of a romantic thing, sweet, you know, uh, you imagine... Garrison Keillor meets Woody Allen writing Hallmark cards or something like that. But uh, it was a piece I wrote about how, uh, how amazing and wonderful I thought um, uh, women here in Iowa are, uh, Iowa women. Uh, it was called Brains, excuse me, yeah, Brains, Brawn, and Beauty, I believe was the title they gave. Brains, Brawn, and Beauty. That's so that's, that's what I'll be reading for you. Take us out this afternoon. When I first moved to Iowa, <clears throat> I'm going to start that again. I got my inaugural throat clear out of the way. When, I'm, when I first moved to Iowa City, I would get knocked off kilter when attractive women I didn't know would smile and nod at me when we'd pass each other by on the sidewalk or in the aisle at the grocery store or the public library. This was a lot different from the make no eye contact, keep your purse clenched under your arm like a football, keys in your hand, ready to get the eyes, posture I was accustomed to seeing women adopt when I lived in Chicago. I've seen women in Iowa walking down the street with actual footballs clenched under their arm, but they never looked like they were about to straight arm me. I've also seen them clenching stacks of books and cases of beer, and sometimes even bags of compost they were taken to their garden someplace, but always with good humor. From time to time, they've even clenched my heart too, and however long they've held it for, I've always been better off for it. Perhaps the women back in Chicago weren't all quite so ready to attack, but they certainly weren't in the habit of smiling at strangers on the street. Maybe they would if they had a clipboard in their hands and were asking you if you had just a few minutes for the environment or whatever other cause du jour they were chilling for that week, or if it was the kind of neighborhood that was in the news a lot for women being very friendly to strangers and were often arrested for it as a result. The first dozen or so times this happened, I actually turned around to look over my shoulder to see who it was they were smiling at. When I saw no one there behind me and I realized I was the intended recipient of their smile, I'd respond with a pointless, half-hearted wave to their back as they walked away from me, a wave they never saw, and a lot of them might have mistaken me for being shy. I was simply not accustomed to strangers acknowledging each other on the street without some scheme being involved. Though such friendliness is often referred to as being a Midwestern phenomenon, where I'm from is a part of the Midwest, and I've certainly never experienced anything like this there. There's probably some dry sociological reason that explains this difference, but I just like to think it's because the women in Iowa City are so uniquely wonderful. They're untainted by the cynicism and world wariness and leeriness of strangers that women from bigger cities seem to have, 
Weariness which so often turns the act of getting to know someone just well enough to ask for their phone into something only slightly less dangerous than a high wire unicycle act performed above a minefield. I moved to Iowa City to be with one amazing woman and stuck around to be with a second amazing one when the first relationship didn't work out. The second relationship didn't work out either, ultimately, but I have no regrets about either and I'm going to stick around for a while because there's no place else in the world I'd rather keep trying to get it right. You know, a friend of mine who spent some time in the Army once called Iowa City a target-rich environment for a visit, and numbers-wise, I suppose he was right. But it's not the fresh batch of young co-eds spit out of a hopper someplace who arrive here each fall and turn this town into that Star Trek episode where they visit the planet of blonde girls who all wear too big sunglasses and too tight black tights that appeals to me. Sure, because of the University of Iowa, there are many very attractive young women here, more than anywhere else I've ever lived. Enough distracting eye candy to guarantee a legion of auto body shops a brisk business all year round. But whatever passing thrill that the mere sight of them might provide you with will ultimately be a fleeting one. The best part, the best part about growing old with someone is the time you get to spend together while you're doing it. The person who first caught your eye in short shorts on the ped mall or shirtless playing ultimate frisbee at age 20 would probably cause you to burst out laughing if you saw them wearing the same outfit 30 or 40 or 50 years later. But that's okay, because if you're still together 50 years later, I think you've probably impressed each other plenty enough. It's not the quantity of women who live here or their beauty or youth that makes Iowa City such a wonderful place to live. No, it's the quality. The women I've known in Iowa possess a certain kindness, practicality, intelligence I've never encountered anywhere else. They'll not only watch football with you without prodding, they'll follow the game and understand what's happening on the field and oftentimes often color commenta commentary better than what's on TV. They will not only not balk at the idea of eating biscuits and gravy with you, they'll make it for you. To me, these are uniquely Iowa traits. A woman I dated in Chicago once called me to ask come hang some shelves for her. A woman I dated in Iowa City once asked to borrow my table saw so she could cut her own. I think that's pretty damn impressive. It's Chicago that's immortalized as the city of big shoulders, but none of the women I ever dated there ever actually had them. And I think this is a vastly unappreciated quality when seeking out a mate. None of the girlfriends I ever had when I lived in Chicago had ever baled hay or used post hole digger tools for a barbed wire fence or spent two hours lugging 50 pound feed bags into the barn in the middle of a blizzard. Some of the women I've known here in Iowa have, have actually have. I've seen it. This sort of honest labor cultivates an entirely different look, an entirely different outlook on life. If you come from a long line of stockbrokers, lawyers, and art dealers, and it's your doorman who carries the groceries you ordered online into the lobby for you when they're delivered to your high-rise by the lake. Women in Iowa tend to put on airs. They put on sunscreen in the summer and chapstick in the winter and bug spray in between, and that's about it. So I think of these things now as Valentine's Day approaches and men will be asked to express their true feelings for the women in their lives. And I think that a few PBRs and some burgers at George's is more than enough to make for a romantic evening if you're with the right person. How could that possibly be improved upon? If you have someone you're spending Valentine's Day with, go there together to celebrate it. Sit in a dark booth and lean in close and be thankful and laugh together and whisper sweet things in each other's ears. They don't even have to be true as long as your feelings for each other are. And if you don't have someone special you're spending Valentine's Day with this year, just remember where you are and that it will be well worth the wait if you're lucky enough to find that person here. When you do, remember it was Iowa City that brought you together and be thankful for that too. Happy Valentine's Day, City. Thank you, Tom. I think my mic, oh, there's my mic. Be back next week. The regular Tom's Guitar Show. 
from downstairs, the studios of public access television. I want to thank uh, young Tom over here for all his indulgence. It's enough to make me want to have a cup of coffee. I want to thank Uptown Bills and the staff of Public Access Television. And uh, next week, next month, we're going to have a mandolin player here, and it's going to be a big deal for him. I hope we'll play all kinds of wild and crazy stuff. But uh, until then, signing off. Now I'm just, we're clear, but don't swear just in case. No, no, no bad language because. <laughs>